Welcome to Portland Rising. I'm Marian McHugh from the Portland Phoenix, and each month the Portland Phoenix produces with our friends at the Portland Media Center a show focusing on news, interviews, arts, and entertainment each month, and uh, we have some very interesting guests tonight. We have Doug Rooks, who's a veteran political reporter in the state of Maine and the author of several books, including his most recent, which is First Franco, Albert Bellavo in Law, Politics, and Love. And he's going to be talking about an issue he's written about recently for the Portland Phoenix. The, the, the challenges, the, and there are many, facing CMP. And a little later, we're going to hear from Greg Levinsky, who's a Portland native and daring alumnus who's written for the Boston Globe and the Detroit Free Press and who's now writing a sports column for the Phoenix. And he's gonna be writing about, talking about the return of tackle football. So we'll get, we'll get to Greg a little later. And Doug, can you tell us what you think are the big challenges facing CMP? You know, it's really kind of hard to keep up with them all, but um, in the simplest possible terms, there will definitely be a referendum on the ballot in November, just two months, that would essentially decertify state approvals for a power line that is currently under construction to Canada from Northern Maine that will then bring electricity from Hydro-Quebec's many dams on the James Bay down to the state of Massachusetts. And this has caused multiple issues involving the legislature, the attorney general's office, the governor's office, and it can get very confusing even for veteran reporters like myself, for instance, um, the second referendum, which is virtually certain now, that will be on the ballot next year, and that is a very different kind of measure. It's not just about a power line or one construction project. It's about the very existence of CMP, Central Maine Power, which has been, you know, Maine's public utility, premier public utility for more than 100 years. So it's a very big deal, and essentially it would take management and ownership away from the investors who have always supported this company and, and financed it. And it would turn it over to the state of Maine and would create a customer owned um, thing to replace both CMP and Bearsant, the former Bangor Hydro Network, uh, which collectively served 95% of the people of Maine. So it's a very big deal. And most Mainers haven't the cl a clue about it what it might be, mean and be. And, you know, it's almost getting more complicated from the very beginning because just yesterday, uh, CMP, or at least people who back CMP's position have announced they're going to do their own referendum question, which if I understand it correctly, if we do decide on a consumer owned utility publicly financed, they will then have another referendum to decide whether we want to borrow the huge amount of money, billions of dollars, that would be required to do this. So who knows where that's going? So I think um, we would all be well advised to focus more on the current issue before us, because that's what we're going to have to vote on in two months. So that issue is a fascinating, um, there's a fascinating collection of interest groups and supporters on both sides, uh, and they're very strange bedfellows. So that might be a good place to start. Okay, the Hydro-Quebec line is the result of roughly 15 years of effort by Massachusetts, which was one of the very first states to commit to renewable energy. Maine has done this. We passed a big law in 2019 to do this, but Massachusetts did it long ago. Their problem has actually been doing it. You know, they had the law in the books and they have solicited multiple proposals to do this. Now, the one that they ended up picking a couple of years ago was originally supposed to go through New Hampshire 
In other words, a line from Hydro-Quebec's dams down through New Hampshire called the Northern Pass Project, and, and then end terminating in Massachusetts the same way the CMP line will do. The problem there was they wanted to run the line through the White Mountain National Forest, one of the premier recreation areas in the Northeast, and frankly, that was too much even for New Hampshire. And they had a special siting committee, which unanimously rejected it. However, anticipating that result, Massachusetts already had a backup plan. And we're the backup plan. Okay? Theoretically, they could have run it through Vermont, New Hampshire, <clears throat> or Maine. And the irony here is they have a permitted route through New Vermont already. Unfortunately, since it goes under Lake Champlain, it's extremely expensive. So they naturally prefer the main route, which goes through the northern main woods, an area that to opponents of the line is pristine wilderness and to the supporters of the line is industrial forest land. You take your pick. I think we can all agree on it's a very remote area of Maine, very unlikely to be seen by most Mainers today. So it's really almost like, what do you think about what's going on up there? Do you see wilderness? Do you see industrial forest land that's been producing timber for 250 years? It's a real tough one. And the voters are going to have a lot on their plate when they decide yes or no. So, of course, as usual, um, the referendum is not that simple. <clears throat> it's partly the result of, I'm trying to be quick about summarizing this, but it's important to know this. The Massachusetts proposal, which got 100% of the power from Hydro-Quebec, was not very popular in New England. And a number of the environmental groups, uh, including the Conservation Law Foundation, which does support the line with conditions, and some of those conditions were actually embodied in the PUC order approving it, they really were disappointed because they thought originally that it would be a mix of sources, you know, some hydropower from Canada, but a lot of renewable energy projects in Northern Maine, which is right near the line. And those projects are on the drawing board and they could still be built, but they weren't awarded by Massachusetts. So they'd have to be separate constructed with approvals from the state of Maine. So it gets very confusing and complicated because you have environmental groups on both sides of this issue. You have Republican legislators on both sides of this issue. You even have a couple of Democrats who support the line, even though most legislators don't. And Governor Janet Mills, who probably is the most important voice here, does support the line, as does her predecessor, Paul Page, who's running for governor. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a real tough one. And I think the biggest problem for the voters is just sorting all this out. You know, it really is very confusing. So I think at that point, I could probably use a question from the host yeah, here. Doug, a um, couple of things that are striking that you've mentioned in your story. The re retroactivity provisions yes. that are in the referendum, as well as the fact, as you've alluded to, two separate questions, that... Um, that you know, gas companies, fossil fuels, as you said, strange bedfellows have aligned on either side in ter terms of pouring money uh, into this very, very um, controversial question. Are those things you can talk to? Uh, is that because a lot of people are worried about the retroactivity provision and, and how important is that? Well, I think it's, I don't think it's very important to the voters because they, they're just going to give a yes or no verdict. I think it's really for the voters about, do you think hydropower from Canada is a good idea? It has some benefits from Maine. We clearly get some benefits, but most of the benefits flow to Massachusetts. Indirectly, we get cleaner air as a result because if hydropower flows to Massachusetts, they will shut down a lot of fossil fuel plants, particularly natural gas, and that affects our air. So in some ways it's a win for the environment, but it's, it's, it's complicated. So I think the, um, the, the voters will probably be thinking, oh, do, is hydropower from Canada, despite its flaws, better than continuing to run natural gas plants in New England? That would be a crucial consideration for them. The retroactivity part is necessary to the cause of the people who wrote the referendum because they, they tried to get the, a similar question on the ballot last year. And the Supreme Court said that's not a properly framed question. We're striking it from the ballot. So it's come back in a different form, which includes these retroactivity clauses. They're basically two. They would say the PUC approvals, which were relatively recent, 2019, I believe, going into 2020, we would 
you know, say that that order approving the line is null and void. The other one is really more interesting. It's from a 2014 lease granted through the LePage administration that allows this line to run across public reserved lands. Now we should, you know, this is a concept that many Mainers are still unfamiliar with. So you have to understand public reserve land is simply publicly owned land that's managed for the benefit of the public. It is not a state park. We don't have any state forest, so it's not that. It's simply land that's held by the state for the benefit of the, of the highest and best use for Mainers. Now in 2014, with very little ado, the, admin, the Page administration got the Bureau of Public Lands to approve this lease, lease saying there was no significant impact on the existing values of that land, which is very remote. I mean, it's not like anybody goes there very often. So, however, the lease in the estimation of many people was very poorly done and they didn't provide much in the way of reasoning. So when Janet Mills took office in 2019, as a supporter of the line, she basically got the Bureau of Public Lands to issue a revised lease. So both of those leases would have to be revoked for, you know, for the line to be actually canceled. Otherwise you get into the, all this legal stuff where one agency is saying yes, others are saying no. So they kind of went for the whole enchilada and said, all these leases are canceled. But there's also a current court case in which there has been a ruling at the superior court level that the lease was improperly granted. However, the Supreme Court of Maine, which will probably rule before November on this question, may in fact reverse that. So, you know, it's, it's a head scratcher but I do think voters would be well advised to just think about the question of, let, you know, do you think this is a good idea or not? And then allow the courts to do their job if they need to. Clearly, if the referendum is turned down, all those legal questions I just mentioned are moot. But if it is approved, you can be guaranteed that CMP will be in court contesting, you know, the terms of the referendum, whether it's, whether it's really a properly drafted law and I, you know, many people who've studied this for a long time and are not passionately involved on either side say, you know, it's a really tough stretch to imagine this referendum will be constitutional because primarily of that retroactivity provision. So it's a long answer to a short question, but that's where we are these days. And I think you said they're still cutting in that area because there's been no injunction no. to prevent it, even though Justice Murphy... Right. Um, did rule yep. that the lease was yep. correct? Um, there is cutting going on. There was a separate uh, case, a different court case before the Federal Court of Appeals in Boston First Circuit, and they did grant a temporary injunction. Uh, but then the, when the full court heard the case, they lifted the injunction. The cutting is going ahead. They are clearing, they're widening a section from Lewiston to the contested area, the new cutting that has been going on. They're putting up poles and all that, and they are going ahead uh, last I heard, they've probably done about 20% of the new section of the 53-mile line to Canada. So that is going ahead. Um, the court case that Justice Murphy ruled on is about the lease only. It does not, it does not stop them from constructing. And CMP, for whatever reasons they have, decided to go ahead with construction. And I think their belief is the fact that they're providing a lot of jobs in an, in an area of high unemployment may sway a few voters to their side. And, but if they lose the case, they're, they're out a lot of money, clearly. They've, they've invested a lot of money in a project that then is belly up. So, you know, there are a lot of risks on both sides here. It's very interesting. Doug, uh, thank you. We've about used up the time. And if there's any final thoughts that you have to, to share or observations. Well, my final thought is, we may be asking the voters to do too much through the referendum process. Normally, these big, complex issues are handled at the legislature, and we have an odd situation where the governor and legislators of her own party are very much at odds here, and that's a difficult situation. Normally, this would be, and the legislature did pass this, the, you know, they didn't pass the, well, no, they, earlier they did try to shut down the line, and they were unsuccessful because Janet Mills vetoed those bills. She also vetoed the public power bill this year. And I think, you know, in some ways for our system to work effectively, we've got to get those people back on the same page because, you know, the legislature and the governor ultimately are the best um, are the best places to resolve these issues. The voters are going to have a tough time. And I would not be um, surprised if we wake up on the day after the election and say, oh, my God, what did they do? But, you know, 
I'm not sure that voters really should be asked to make such complex decisions. That, that's my thought. Thank you, Doug. That's very interesting and helpful as, as we approach November. You're welcome. Turning the page very dramatically, uh, we have Greg Levinsky. Greg is our, our sports columnist. And Greg, um, we're talking about tackle football. Yeah, what, yeah for what's sure. Going on? <laughs> well, it's back. Um, Maine was one of very few states uh, last year that totally eliminated tackle football um, because of COVID, of course. There was some seven-on-seven -seven flag football, which uh, served its purpose for a lot of kids. But I think tackle football being back is – really good for um, a very large subset of kids, which are the linemen, the big, the big fellas up front, uh, both offensively and defensively. Those don't exist in seven on seven football. Um, so it's great that those kids can get another opportunity to get back out there and represent their schools. Um, I know that uh, tackle football obviously comes with its risks, of course, uh, with concussions and, uh, and injury and, and all that. But I do think it's, it's important to focus on, uh, the perspective of looking at high school football as a community event, uh, something that people rally around, that towns rally around, student bodies get excited for. And I know I'm looking forward to uh, getting out to the Deering Portland game uh, and not cheering on my alma mater, but uh, coming up with something interesting uh, for later in the week. And, you know, it's funny, a few months ago, it seemed like, tackle football coming back was going to sort of usher in this sense of what we thought was normalcy. Um, and now maybe not the case uh, with, you know, Delta variant and, and COVID-19. But I think something that is wonderful is hopefully that tackle football can serve as an outlet for a lot of these kids uh, as our times continue to be pretty crazy and unpredictable, uh, I think is the, the best way we can describe it. You said it, and it, it's a very tough time for these kids. They've just gotten back into school, a lot of them, because they weren't even in school for much of last year, which was something. And to, you know, it's like, what does it mean you know, for these kids now to be back in school and to have their extracurriculars, whether it's soccer or football, is incredibly meaningful. Um, and I hope, I, I guess, so far, even with the variants out there, things are moving forward, it seems. so. Yeah, I mean, I think that there are certain, obviously, protocols in place. There have been quite a few games that were canceled in week one. I think something like eight game, or eight teams uh, were impacted by COVID with some games canceled across the state. So it's obviously something that has to be watched for at all times, and it's something that is sort of in the back pocket or in the back of the minds of coaches, athletic directors, student-athletes, parents, that – never was around before for high school football. Um, so it definitely, or high school sports, I guess, last year had to deal with it. So there's some sort of uh, idea of how to, how to roll with it. But um, like, like we all know, watching, you know, or reading uh, the, the Delta variant and, and perhaps others are a little bit different than, than what we experienced even a year ago today. Um, that being said, I think that, a lot of these schools uh, had great success with staying open last year uh, with whatever they chose to do in their hybrid model or having kids back, you know, three or four days a week, one or two days a week, whatever it was. Um, schools did find a way. Uh, it may not have been perfect and it may not have been easy. I'm sure it wasn't easy, uh, but I think that it's definitely inspired a lot of resiliency for kids and staff members. So um, you know, it's I, like, we know, uh, anything can change at the drop of a hat, you know, on a moment's notice. Uh, but hopefully, you know, more good can come out of it than, than the risk. The, the Portland school system seem, is very steady this year on getting kids back into school, even though there's, you know, there's been some disagreement. People think there's not enough careful protocols. So let's, let's hope that they're able to continue, but I'm wondering, I have to admit, I've never been to a during to the Thanksgiving Day game. So perhaps you can, and I know it means a lot, yeah. obviously. In the, in the no, city. it's funny. I was talking <laughs> about this with one of my friends the other day, and um, I am a what third generation Deering alum. 
Um, my dad went there, his two brothers, my cousin, two of my cousins, my sister, my grandfather, who's turning 95 soon. Hmm. Um, so it, it definitely runs in the family. Uh, something that my dad tells me about uh, was that the during Portland Thanksgiving Day game used to get like 20,000 people or, or a huge, huge amount of people. And now it doesn't. Um, and that's really unfortunate. Every year, it seems like there's talk of canceling it. Um, and that's too bad because the players really care. Um, it, it, I think it's unfortunate that the community uh, doesn't necessarily rally behind their schools with, with the pride that, that they used to. And I think there's obviously multiple reasons for that. People move away more for jobs or whatnot. Um, but I think that it's really important and maybe this pandemic can be a turning point where people get more excited about what's right in front of them. Uh, and I really hope that people do go out because the kids care so much. I know uh, the new Deering coach, John Hardy, is a Deering alum. He graduated, I think, in 2011. So I know it will mean a lot to him and those kids. Um, and for the people that still do enjoy it, it does mean a lot. I just hope that more people can uh, realize or enjoy what, what, what's right in front of them because it's, I think that when people go to high school games and support high school athletic events, it elevates the play and makes it more fun for the kids. It, it's fun as a spectator or as a reporter. It's enjoyable to see the kids competing hard and having their attention. It just goes back and forth and it really complements each other. So, you know, I, I hope that, uh, I hope that high school football and, and every other sport uh, gets good crowds. I think it's important to share the stories of the student athletes, especially, I mean, the coaches too, but I think especially of the kids, it's really important to to get their stories out there so people can uh, have people to root for. I think it's really awesome to have someone local nearby to root for, you know, and, and when it's, when you live on Dartmouth street and you can walk five minutes to Fitzpatrick stadium and show up and, you know, even for a quarter, um, it would mean something to kids and, and parents and, and coaches. So, I think for me, I have, you know, Portland sports mean a lot to me personally um, because of, I think, because of my dad and uh, my family, uh, even though none of us are very good athletes, we can all admit that, but we do love sports. Um, and I hope that people, uh, I hope there's like a renaissance or a resurgence uh, of people caring because I think it's really important, builds community. Um, and I like to see sports as a lens to, you know, everyday life as a microcosm of everyday life. And I, I really do, you know, have faith that people will return uh, to these things sort of renewed as I mean, I think we have in everything, uh, whether it was our first trip back to the grocery store or first time back in the restaurant or whatever. Um, I think that we all have come away with relishing things that we have access to. So, um, you know, let's hope that that translates to uh, local sports. Well, Greg, I know you like sports at all levels and, you know, you've written, you've written about the Red Sox or, and the Sea Dogs, you know, for the globe, but there's something about, and the people I know and the writers I know who are very interested in, there's something about high school sports that is really means a lot. And as you said sort of telling the stories of those kids and what it means to them um and i think that's 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 great it's very interesting and um very meaningful when do you have um i suppose it's too early to like handicap what are the mm -hmm. top teams this year or who are you looking yeah, at yeah that's or? tough i mean honestly i'm really with this column and, and in general i'm really want to be focused on the portland schools if I can, Portland Deering, you know, maybe some Chevrolet and Wayne Fleet. Uh, obviously, the kids that go to Casco Bay, because I think that something that happens with high school sports in general is there are so many stories that go untold. Because I bet, you know, on a 60 person football team, I bet 50 of the kids, maybe not 50, 40, whatever of the kids have a story that would be worth publication somewhere. Um, so I think that it's really critical that we share these stories because they're otherwise, they're just never getting out. Um, and you never know who it can help. Um, it really means a lot to me personally uh, when when a family is pleased by a story and they share it, not because it's my work, but because 
it demonstrates pride for the story that was told and they want people to to get out there and it might help someone depending on the subject matter of the story and it doesn't have to be necessarily something sad it can be about someone's business they started or something they do on the side and someone might say oh like a little kid might say mom i can do that too um, I think it's really important that that little kids get role models and hopefully, you know, if they read a story about a kid at Portland high school or they hear about it, their parents read about it and say, Hey, did you know about this kid uh, who is in a junior at Portland? And they might, you know, get excited. I know when I was little, I had kids and, and athletes who were in high school in the local area that I looked up to. I don't think, I'm sure they didn't know that I looked up to them and I don't know what a lot of them are doing today. A lot of them probably didn't even play in college. Um, but I think that everyone can find a role model uh, in their own high school next door. So, Greg, well, thank you. That's a great description. And we're really looking forward to having your coverage and your columns yeah. in the Phoenix uh, as the fall goes on. So thank you very much. And thank you all uh, for being with us tonight. Please join us. Please join us next month when we will have another edition of Portland Rising. Thank you. Thank you.